I want to also just kind of fill you in on what's been going on with, with uh, Sherry and I over the last six weeks. I flew out six weeks ago to South Africa where our friend Jacques had kindly uh, offered me a house on the property there um, at Shikwaru. So I had a little farmhouse there where I could shut myself away and work on my project. I was looking for 40 pages. I ended up with 36. And so I'm close, but um, moving, through, moving through that process. In the midst of that, we jumped into the small plane and flew up to Zambia, where I was engaged uh, for a little bit with Joyce Myers Ministries there. Joyce was supposed to be there. She pulled her ticket at the last minute, and her son Dan was there. But uh, we saw just kind of firsthand what their teams do. What a wonderful missional partner. I will tell you this about Joyce Myers Ministries. When they say they're going to do something in a place in the world, they do do it. And they go above and beyond. And so it was so great to see their hearts and that integrity, but spent just a couple of days uh, with them and seeing what they were doing in medical missions, then back to South Africa where I was engaged in study until I flew off two weeks ago to meet my bride in, in Rome. And then we got on a cruise ship and followed the footsteps of Paul. And uh, in, we were in seven ports and five of those ports were ports where Paul's feet touched the ground and we walked through the ruins and we stood on beaches where we knew he had come ashore and were absolutely uh, stunned and amazed and so blessed to be able to now paint the backdrop a little bit better. In, in two minutes, in the middle of ancient Corinth, I was able to see things positioned in the way that Paul wrote to the Corinthians and also in the 18th chapter of Acts, I was able to see it like I had never seen it before. And I'll be sharing some of that in a couple of weeks on Wednesday night as we'll be rolling into the 18th chapter of Acts uh, in our Acts study. But we've had a, a, a wonderful time. It's been a restful time. Uh, we're getting over the jet lag now. We're, we're just getting back on track. I do need to pause for a moment. And I'm so appreciative of, of Joe Phillips and Rick Ross who came and ministered uh, here at Calvary and served you. I heard wonderful things about their ministry, but I have heard as much and even, even more about Pastor Tom and Pastor Phil and Pastor Scott and Pastor G and their pulpit ministry, and I honor them. I'm telling you, it thrills my heart. It thrills my heart. Somebody said when I was walking in, you better watch it. And I said, watch it. I want, I want to see these guys and these gals excel in ministry to rise to, to a whole new level. And so I'm just uh, incredibly proud uh, of them, if you'll allow me that, and blessed to minister with such a great team. I'll use a line from... Actually, it was a movie title, and Jack Nicholson was the star actor in it, and he usually plays someone who's crazy. As a crazy, well, not as a crazy, as a guy with, with, with over-the-top obsessive-compulsive disorder, he walks into the waiting room of his therapist, turns to an entire room of people who all have their emotional problems, and he says this one thing. What if this is as good as it gets? It's one of the funniest lines. It's not funny here, I guess, but it's very funny <laughs> in the context of a waiting room full of people who are emotionally unstrung. He asks a question that would trouble them a little bit. Let me trouble you a little bit. What if this is as good as it gets? As you look at your, as you look at your life right now, let me, let me ask you, have you a sense that this is as good as it gets or I've already got as good as it gets and I'm on the downside? Do you see your life as a life being directed and unpacked by supernatural power with creative genius, or do you see your life kind of running out on the rails into a wilderness someplace? Is there ongoing building? Is there ongoing development in you? Over the next six weeks, against the backdrop of our planning for some upfitting here at Calvary. We've got, we've got some upfitting that's going to come to all of our lobbies and to some extra spaces here and there in the great room. And a lot of this is going to be remade. And so against, against all of that, I began to think in terms of spiritual realities that by far surpass anything you could ever do to a building. 
And over the next six weeks, I want to talk to you and challenge you with a new series called Upfit. Upfit. And I want to talk about you. Isn't that great? You get to go to church and the pastor's going to talk about you. Everybody loves to hear themselves talked about, don't they? No? Okay. Wrong again. Monday morning, I stood in the footsteps of, of Paul in ancient Corinth. He walked this street. This is on the Agora. There's a lot of these tiles that remain in place that go all the way back uh, pre-first century. And you walk down Corinth. You're walking in the footsteps of Paul in some place on that Agora. Paul and Aquila and Priscilla worked on tents and Somewhere close by, there was a Jewish synagogue that Paul taught in and was ultimately thrown out of. And right there also, you see other key elements that fit into the story of Paul. Towering above the ruins, you can just make out the remains of the temple of the temple to uh, Aphrodite. At the top of that mountain, you can see those little, they look like little teeth up there. I left the, I left the uh, photo as it was so you could see the lower ruins of Corinth because that's where Paul was. But towering above are the ruins of the temple to Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love who was famed for her thousand, one thousand temple prostitutes. Throughout the, throughout the East, the sexuality and religion were, were so intermixed. And in Greek mythology, you know this. And in the, in the, in the, the religions that, that grasped the area that eventually Abraham moved into, there were huge fertility cults. And, and sex and religion were so mingled and so meshed together. And nowhere, nowhere at this time in history, nowhere more than in Greece, and so you've got the temple to Aphrodite and you've got all of these sexual rituals going on. A thousand, a thousand temple prostitutes. Now, that temple was in ruins by the time that Paul went to Corinth. It was already abandoned. It was already pretty much destroyed. But the shadow of that heritage of immorality marked Corinth as the Las Vegas of her times. Corinth was an evil, wicked place. It was on an isthmus of land between two harbors on either side, two seas. And so you had sailors coming in on both sides and Corinth was where the world came together and every vice you can imagine wasn't just there in Corinth, it was in your face. We may, we may be approaching that brazenness in our culture in these days, we may. I walked Corinth's Broadway to this elevated stage. This is the Bema. There's a plaque on the front that identifies it as such. Bema. This raised platform at the head street and at the top of the street to where when you stood there, you spoke to everyone in the marketplace, but also down the main street that went all the way to the port. As you stood there and you, you would speak People could hear you from that entire area and there the orators were invited to speak and there the judges came and they either convicted or they acquitted those who had made waves in Sin City. And Paul, Paul was brought right here. It's reported in Luke, in Acts, uh, by Luke in Acts chapter 18. And a ruler named Gallio who stood in the Bema and he looked at Paul and was there to judge him. He chose in that situation to acquit Paul because he didn't want to dig into the Jewish religious ethnic issues. He just, he didn't want to get into it. And so he said, you Jews deal with it as you Jews will deal with it, but we're out of this. And I climbed the stairs. The stairs have been excavated. You can walk right up the same stairs that Paul would have walked up. Overlooking this massive boulevard at the other end, actually the end that we're sitting in right now, if you go that way, this, this paved road, this, this, lime, or this uh, marble and, and limestone road went all the way to the port. It would have been magnificent and it was lined by statues. It was a testimony to Greek culture and, and to, uh, to, to its day and to the glory, the glory of Rome even in its day. Ran all the way to the harbor. 
And there, standing on the bema to the right, I found a biblical inscription, the only Bible inscription I could find in all of Corinth. And even after touring the museum, very little was said about Paul or Jesus or the gospel. It was all about Greek mythology and it was all about the ancient ruins. I tuned it out. I did my own tour. I left them under a tree. Bless them. As I was standing on the bema alone looking to one side, there was a stone, this stone. And I don't know when it was placed there. It's not dated. It certainly wasn't from Paul's time. But somebody has left this stone with this inscription from 2 Corinthians 4.17, for this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. I read that and I was stunned. Because for the previous two weeks, my sleep had been disturbed in South Africa. I was awakened in the middle of the night, turned on the light, opened my Bible, and was absolutely transfixed, mesmerized for about an hour in the, in that, in the, in the dead of night with the fourth chapter of Second Corinthians. I couldn't turn away from it. I had looked at a text that I was going to use as the basis for this series, and so I'm sure that was planted in my psyche someplace, but I know in those moments that the Lord awakened me in the middle of the night. He awakened me for this particular chapter, and I spent an hour reading those words and reading them aloud over and over. Places, you know where Paul says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Now you say, well, that's not that moving. It was to me. I lay in bed with tears flowing down my cheeks. Reading the fourth chapter, it was like every word of the fourth chapter came alive. So I have to tell you, when I stepped up onto the Bema in Corinth two weeks later, stood there having seen no Bible anywhere, and turned to my right and saw 2 Corinthians 4.17, I kind of had a meltdown. Because you see, it's only one verse removed from my key text for this entire series, which is found in verse 16 of 2 Corinthians. And it says, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Why don't we say that together? Let's read that together because this is going to be our theme for six weeks. Will you read it with me? With a little bit of passion, okay? So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Would you, one more time, would you do that with me? So we do not lose heart, <laughs> though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. So Lord, I pray you would add a blessing to your word today. Etch it on our hearts for these weeks, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we boarded a bus right out of, out of the museum area there in Corinth. We got back on a bus and we went 90 minutes to re, back to reboard our, our cruise ship. As I mentioned, while I was writing and studying in Africa for those first 30 days, Sherry had joined me in Rome, and so this was a time for us. We were passengers on the Celebrity Reflection, a magnificent cruise ship, and I won't try and instill envy uh, or I, I'll, I won't go over the edge, as you know I'm apt to do, but it was fabulous. It was fabulous. The ship was magnificent. It was just seven years old. Seven years old. And you could not tell, you couldn't tell that it wasn't brand new. I marveled at every detail, so clean, so orderly, maintained, polished, vacuumed, mopped, swept. Probably looks just like your house. It was stunning. You see, for seven years, this is what amazed me, for seven years, that ship has not stopped sailing, hardly for a single day. If she stops sailing for a day, there's something major. Either there's a, a, a dry dock engine repair type of thing, but from what I could tell, that had not occurred. For seven years, this ship has not stopped sailing. She is always embarking and debarking a steady stream of messy humans of every size, shape, creed, and tongue, who, it seems to me, are bent on her destruction. 
They grind her carpets. They smear every glass surface with their nasty hands. They stain, they stain her fabrics. They break her flatware, her chairs, her fittings. They loiter and litter and let their kids run like wild dogs. They marinate in her jacuzzis, forming a disgusting stew. They slime her pools with suntan oil. They spill their drinks. They drip their ice cream cones or their gelatos. They leave their dinner tables looking like a decimated war zone to go off and scuff up her dance floors and they can't dance to save their lives. They jam her towel dispensers. They spread all manner of germ and pestilence on every handle, every rail, every push. Don't you want to take a cruise? But then we have to account for the fact that this ship is also under daily and deadly assault from the sea itself, threatening to rust her into dereliction, and she's blasted by wind and storm and sun and grit. By now, she should be one rusty old bucket quarantine for the plague, floating as a hazardous waste zone. That would be carnival. I'm sorry. I'm so, that's so bad. That's so bad. I'm sorry, but no, she's looking brand new and shining and stainless and spotless, reflecting a glorious elegance. And I ask myself, self, how can this be? Well, I'll tell you. Painters never stop painting, and the mops and the squeegees are never stilled, and the vacuums and the polishers are humming someplace always, and the dusters are dusting, and the mechanics are mechanicking on rotating shifts, and the IT specialists are making sure that everything is, is functioning, and all the lights are lit, and the hotel professionals, and the sailors, and the waiters, and the welders, and the lighting wizards are always at work around the clock. They never stop. It's really, it's really quite simple. The ship is renewed day by day. For we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. It's a battle against the elements. And so I, I looked at the second chapter of Corinthians, or I should say second Corinthians chapter four, and actually backed up from there and started reading through the entire book again and began to identify what were the elements? What were the elements that were battering against Paul, causing the outer self to be wasting away? What, what was Paul up against? Because if I could understand what Paul was up against, maybe I could get a grip. Maybe I could find a new grasp on living in our day and age. Let's identify a few elements that shaped Paul's fourth chapter in 2 Corinthians. He spoke often, starting in the fourth verse of the first chapter, he spoke often of affliction. Verse four and verse eight, he says, who comforts our afflictions. Verse five, we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings. Verse eight, you know of my affliction in Asia. We were so utterly burdened beyond our strength. We despaired of life itself. Paul says we were going through a hard place. We despaired of life itself. This is Paul. Think about it for a moment. Paul if anyone, if anyone should be able to write of constant triumph and victory, it's Paul, wouldn't you say? One of the greatest men of faith that's ever walked, as best we can tell as we read the scriptures, Paul. How can Paul testify of this kind of affliction? Despaired of life itself? The apostle Paul wondered if he was going to make it? I mean, he's the Bible's Iron Man. The one who writes the greatest declarations of victory, and yet, Paul, really, Paul? Despaired of life itself? This we know when we 
read the scripture, we see real people in real life circumstances and they look a lot like us. Paul understood the nature of our humanity. He wrote, as I mentioned a moment ago, we have this treasure, but this treasure, this treasure is in earthen pots or in jars of clay. The cheapest, most vulnerable, breakable, vessels for transportation of valuables you could imagine. You don't transport valuables in clay. You build a chest of wood or you, you hew out a chest of stone. Not clay. Clay is something you paint it up and it looks really pretty, but you know it's always clay. And you have to be careful when you set it down and you can't toss it around and it's not the type of thing that can take rough shippage. How many of you ship anything in clay? No one, because we know clay is vulnerable. It's easily pitted, it's easily broken. You can paint it up real pretty, but no matter what you do, it's always clay. A moment ago I mentioned I walk with awe and wonder through the magnificent of St. Peter's Basilica in, in Rome, everything larger than life, so richly embellished, and the guide made it so clear, the biggest church, the greatest works, the pinnacle of art, the treasures, and as I walked down the center aisle of that massive church, I could not escape the fact that as I was walking on that stone, I was walking on the graves of 264 popes. So they're all buried, most of them one floor down. Why? Because they were clay. They all died, they're all men. Not one of them, not one of them, with all of the glories of the church and with all of the accolades poured out upon them and all of the glory that they received from people who would look to them, not one of them could live. Not one of them could live an extra day beyond the expiry of that pot of clay. And as I walked, recognizing jars of clay, it's all around me, here I am in the magnificence of all of this glory and beauty and gold and jewels and magnificence. Jars of clay, 264 dead popes. In chapter four and verse eight, Paul talks about the elements that have jostled around his jar of clay, his earthen vessel. He said, we're afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Paul mentions several things here that batter, that batter that clay vessel. The first element is affliction. He said, we are afflicted in every way. Flebo, flebo <laughs> forgive me, flebo is the word, the Greek word that is used to describe being afflicted. And it literally means to suffer affliction, to be, to be troubled, and the idea behind it is to be pressured. Anyone here deal with pressure in life? Wouldn't it be great if all the pressure was gone? If I could get rid of the pressure of this doctorate, I would dance in front of you and I can't dance. I would dance. How many, how many of you have got pressure? I wonder what's pressuring you. Is it a relationship? Is it one of your children? Is it, is it a parent? Is it, is it sickness? Is it the prospect of, of something that's coming down? What is it that pressures you? Is it job demands? Is it expectations? Not able to live up to where your sister or where your brother rose? What, what is it that pressures you? That's the word that Paul uses, this idea of, I am afflicted by this pressure. It's pushing in on me. Pressure. The pressure of circumstances and the pressure of people. Do your circumstances put you under pressure? Have you someone in your life who puts you under pressure? You could say you never would because you're nice people. You could say of them, you are an affliction to me. 
I wouldn't recommend it, especially if they're your boss or mom or dad, but the whole idea is you are putting pressure on me. Paul's afflictions pressured him. In the 11th chapter of the same book, he writes of imprisonments and beatings. Beatings, he says, were countless. We have no idea. Acts only gives us a thumbnail sketch of what happened in the life of Paul. He was repeatedly in trouble. He was repeatedly being beaten and abused. He was repeatedly rejected. He was repeatedly run out of Dodge. You simply cannot, in truth, read the book of Acts any other way. And then when you read what he has to say in 2 Corinthians, you see it in even more detail. He said, five times I received of the hands of the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger in the sea, danger from false brothers, in toils and hardships, through many a sleepless night, in hunger, in thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. This is God's apostle. And apart from these other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Here I find this magnificent man, this outstanding apostle, taking light and life to the Gentile world in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And when I see that, it's very hard for me to reconcile Paul with the televangelist asking supporters to supply him with a brand new $54 million aircraft. I have a hard time with that. And I realize I'll be, you'll say, well, you're criticizing. Yeah, I am. I am. That's absolutely insane. But then again, I have a very hard time connecting with anything on TV anymore. Even the news. Paul was perplexed. Not just afflicted, he said, I'm perplexed, but not crushed. Perplexed, in the Greek, it, it means literally not seeing a way forward. You been there? You're in a relationship, you're working on it, things, it, things aren't working out very well. You, you've just, you've tried, you've promised, promises have been broken, you've been up against the wall, you've been up against that wall, you've been battered around, and finally you look at the relationship and you say, you know, it's hard for us to see a way forward from here. I've learned this about, about Jesus. He's the way maker. When there is no way, he can make a way. When you think it's impossible, he'll show you that he can do the impossible. But we get to the point, like Paul, in our clay pot humanity where we say, I can't see the way forward. That's perplexity. Lord, why am I here? I don't know how to get forward from here. Anyone else said, I can't see my way out of this? I think it's been made especially real to us in the last few weeks with the suicides of Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain, causing people to mourn and say, these people, they had it all. They had fortune, and they had fame, they had success, and they had, they had to have friends. They had this world. And Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain and my heart, my heart's heavy for that. For the, the fact that they didn't understand that this world is not enough. This world is not enough for the human soul. This world is not enough to the longing, for the longing that's deep within you. This world doesn't have what you need. This world cannot answer the deepest longings of your heart. You are going to be perplexed. Finding no way forward if you're looking to the world for an answer. 
And they were looking for the answers and they couldn't find any. The world's not enough. C.S. Lewis, at whose intellect I find myself constantly in awe, Lewis knew that this world was not enough and he said quite famously, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. We were made for another world. This world is not enough. It never will be enough. It'll never satisfy your soul. We were made for another world. Jesus came to open the door that you and I might step into our destiny. So in that context, I'm not shocked to find Paul talking about despairing of his life. Later on saying, I would really rather depart and be with Jesus, but it's more important in the mission for me to be here with you right now. That said, it's a terrible moment when the pressures in life drive you to that point of perplexity and despair where you feel like there's no way out. I want to say to somebody this morning, there's a way. You haven't found it yet, but there's a way. You say, I can't see it. He can make it. You say, no, it's a solid wall. There's no way through this thing. I want you to know, he is the way maker. He can knock down the wall. He can tunnel over it. He can take you around it or over it. He can float you out of it. He can make a way. Your way forward was never, it was never found in the world. Your way forward has always been in Christ. Don't for a moment you sell him short. Look at what he can do. It's a terrible moment. Paul was pressured. Look at the elements that are battering against his, his life. Then he adds to that, he says, persecuted. And persecuted carries the idea of literally being driven out. Paul wasn't just facing resistance. The resistance was armed and aggressive and disciplined and chasing him down. Paul wasn't dealing with live and let live. It was threatenings and slaughterings. Paul lived with the constant awareness that the stones could fly at any moment they already had, that the whip could fall at any time it already had, that the prison door could slam shut behind him tomorrow it already had, that he might be on the run the next day that had already happened. And Paul ran not as a coward would run, but as a brilliant general withdraws to fight another day. But that's pressure. Paul could have been taken in Lystra where he was left for dead as stoned. He could have been taken in Philippi where he was driven out of town or Thessalonica where he was driven out of Berea where he was driven out as enemies. Dogged his steps everywhere that he went and when Paul talks about persecution he's not talking about somebody not liking him. Oh, I'm so persecuted. Well, what's the problem? Well, I, they just don't like me. That's not persecution. That's probably a problem with you. Hey, listen, friends, let's just talk. If people don't like you, you have to own up to a part of that, don't you? No, okay, all right. Sometimes living in that place is it's happy. Now, Paul, Paul's persecuted. That means literally they are on his heels and they want to kill him. Persecuted. And so Paul decided, I can take it. You see, Paul knew that Jesus would never turn his back on him. Do you know that? He'll never turn his back on you, even to the hour of death, even if the outer man is wasted away completely and destroyed, he will not turn his back on you. So what can this life do to me? Put me under pressure. Then Paul says, struck down, struck down, but not destroyed. How many times would you pick yourself up, dust yourself off, refuse to quit if you were struck down? I'll tell you, when I, when I kind of walk through this in my own mind, if I was put in a situation where physical violence was 
a daily, a daily threat against me where if I went someplace because of my testimony of the Christian, somebody came after me and I was dexed day after day after day after day after day. I wonder how I would stand the test. So pampered we are in our Western Christian experience. I wonder. Paul says, I'm struck down, but I'm not destroyed. I love that. Struck down, but not destroyed. One of the greatest lessons I learned in life, I learned by falling off a bicycle. Down is not down. Down is where up begins. If you don't know this, I'm going to help you right now. Down is not down and out. Down, if you're going to trust in the Lord, down is simply where up begins. Every time I've been knocked flat, every time I've been on a road someplace, every time I've been, been nursing my wounds and a little bit of blood along the way, I've got to tell you, in the midst of all, it has come down to this one thing. Am I going to get up or am I just going to lay here? Down is where up begins. If you find yourself down, struck down, recognize that you're right now, you are standing on the platform. You are standing on the platform that will give you a testimony if you will just stand up. Well, and then Paul talks about dangers. He says, I'm in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger, danger, danger. Danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. Oh, and I work hard. Toils and hardships. Oh, life is so hard, Pastor. My job is so difficult. Man, I just work my fingers to the bone and I'm not sure I'm really getting ahead. Well, if you're counting on getting ahead in this life, you're probably never gonna get there, but it's not about this life, is it? Toils and hardships, yeah. And then he adds, apart from all of this, there's the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Paul threw that in for pastors. I'm sure he did. <laughs> daily anxiety for all the churches. Pressure. No wonder, Paul says, the outer self is wasting away. And it is, you know. What lengths will go to to try and preserve the outer self. My goodness. Gym memberships, fad diets, creams and berries, and surgery and technology and transplants and hair plugs and hair plugs. <laughs> Drink this, they say, rub, rub this on every morning. Stay out of the sun, get out in the sun. Eat Mediterranean, sleep at altitude, wrap yourself in seaweed, pack yourself in the Dead Sea salts. And still, I gotta tell you, the outer man is wasting away. You ever seen someone come back from a spa and they don't look much better than when they went? <laughs> I, have to tell, I have to tell you, my wife is brutally honest. She's brutally honest. She is one, she's the most honest person I know. So we're on the cruise ship and we're walking through this area and you know in the spas, they're always trying to sell you everything. It doesn't matter what it is. You talk about selling snake oil. Anyways, we're walking through and, and they said, we have, this, we have this treatment and they had this, was it a little laser thing or something? A laser thing? We can make, your, we can make these wrinkles disappear. Sit down, you know how they are. Just sit down, sit down, sit down. So Sherry sits down. <laughs> you have to love her for this. This is my wife. So they, they kind of, they do their thing and they work on, on one, one wrinkle. I don't know how they found it. She doesn't have any, but anyways, they, they found one. They somehow, God help us. I don't know how they did that, but they, they kept working away and everything else. And <laughs> there's two of them now teamed up on her. One to affirm, right? The, the, the efficacy of the treatment. I love this. And they say to Sherry, doesn't that look better? And she says, no, it really doesn't. <laughs> this was wonderful for me. This was wonderful for me. I love that honesty. And for all that we go through trying to preserve the outer man, it's wasting away. 
But the outer life, you see this outer life we live, it's a shadow life, the temporary shell we're living in. It's the inner life, Paul says, that's eternal. Later on in the chapter he talks about, he says the things that are, the things that are seen, they, they're not eternal, they're temporary, but the things that are not seen, they're eternal. Eternal. The inner self, the inner man, that inner woman is, is destined for constant renewal, constant upfit, constant improvement, day by day. I cannot help but think that there are all too many cases where we are throwing all of our efforts into trying to save what is undoubtedly temporary and completely neglecting those things that are eternal. We take no thought of the treasure. We care only for every little chip we get in the clay pot. The rich fool in Jesus' parable was focused on his barns and his, and his riches, wasn't he? And what did Jesus say to him? Fool. Fool. This day, your soul is required of you. Is your, inner, is your inner self being renewed day by day? And for six weeks, we're going to unpack this. Is it being renewed day by day? Or if the curtain was pulled back this morning, would we see a shriveled, emaciated, gasping little creature? Would we see a soul that's been arrested in its development like, like an infant? Would we see a tired, battered, pressured bundle of nerves and anxiety? If your outer man is better than your inner man, you're a wreck. Don't care what you drove into this place in or what kind of house you're going home to or what kind of special diet you're on or how good you look for your age. I've got to tell you, if your outer man looks better than your inner man, you are an absolute wreck. The inner man, it's where life is. King David understood this. He said, he leads me. He leads me beside, my shepherd leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. But how, and we're out of time, how? Is it automatic? Uh Uh-uh. Because Paul writes to the Romans, he says, don't, and he talks about their behavior, don't conform to this world. That's what they do. Don't conform, but be transformed. There's something to be done here. Be transformed. Don't conform, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Renewal is first an act of surrender. Until you've surrendered, no restoration can take place within you. You can't become a masterpiece if you don't surrender yourself fully to the master. It's impossible. The potter can't restore what he can't touch. He cannot fix you if he can't touch you. And there's a lot of people who are untouchable when it comes to the things of God. They want a manageable deity. They want a religion that they control and they kind of govern and they watch over. They they want God to kind of dance to their tune. They want to create him in their own image. And you can't deal with God that way. He doesn't make that deal. He'll be master, he'll be Lord, or not at all. He doesn't play somewhere in the middle. We come to him and there's only one response for renewal. It starts. It begins. This is only the first step. We've got six weeks, but it's only the first step. It begins at the point of absolute surrender because he can't fix you if he can't touch you. He can't fix you if he can't touch you. I stood in awe and it's a poor picture. I didn't take it because you're not allowed to take pictures in the Sistine Chapel. Do you know how many people do? I'm a right and wrong guy. You tell me, do this, don't do that. I'm good with that. I'm a law and order man. 
So I walked in and they told me I couldn't take pictures in the Sistine Chapel. I was cool with that, no problem whatsoever. I can, I can say it's a hallowed space. So I sat down and on the bench and I was being good. And I watched all of these people go by and they were holding their cell phone down here, taking pictures of their un, under their chin. Guy with his camera out doing kind of this. And, and the guards are everywhere telling them to stop and put their cameras. It drove me nuts. So I'm sorry I don't have a good picture because that does not do it justice. But I stood in awe visiting the Sistine Chapel, not allowed to take a picture, realizing no picture can really take it all in. Michelangelo painted it between 1501 and 1508. And it popped. When I walked into the Sistine Chapel, the artwork, it it popped as though it were painted yesterday. So how? How in 500 years, how could that be? Well, it's been restored. It's been restored. As a matter of fact, technology has got to the point where the restoration they can do now is light years removed from what they could do in the late 1600s or in the 1700s when it was restored at other times. This time, they were able to bring it back almost to its original glory and beauty. It was painted by hand, this thing, by that master Michelangelo laying on his back on a scaffold. And how was it restored? By hand. By an artist laying on his back on a scaffold that was hung from the same holes in the wall that Michelangelo had drilled for his foundations. And the restoration work is absolutely stunning. Even if you're not a lover of art, you walk in and it fills you with awe. Understand that day by day, the restorer climbed the scaffold and mounted in the same position as Michelangelo and he restored that thing day by day. Listen to me. You were made by hand. You were made by hand. God formed you. When you look at the at the broad at just the broad spread of mankind, the Bible says we were formed, shaped from the dust of the earth. Paul says that we are his workmanship. And Paul was a man who worked with his hands, so he, he took from his own trade, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Paul says we were shapen in our mother's womb, and we being shaped by hand can only be restored by hand. His touch, his word, his attentions, his correction, his cleansing, his power every day, every day. You have an inner life in desperate need of constant upfit and God is fully committed to this project. You say, well, I've got a lot of things I want to do in life and God just won't seem to come alongside me and help me do those things. It happens for everyone else, but it never seems to, to happen for me. Make this, make this your desire, your longing to see the hand of God work in your soul and He will guide your steps. It's not ultimately where he takes you in this world that's going to be rolled up like a scroll. It matters what he does in you. And it starts with surrender.